You're watching Natural Lessons with Naturalist James Anderson from the Marion County Park District. Hope you enjoy the show. And most of all, remember to go out and explore your Marion County Parks. Welcome to another episode of Natural Lessons with Naturalist James Anderson. Today's topic is about animal activity, and I call it, When Are You Active? So what we will be learning in this episode, we're going to learn some of the different factors that contribute to animal activity patterns. We're also going to be defining some of the different types of animal activity patterns, such as nocturnal, diurnal, and more. And also, too, we're going to be talking about diurnal versus nocturnal, just basically the advantages of these activity patterns. So now we're going to talk about some of the different factors that control animal activity patterns. Food supply. Uh, this is a, a big, big drive of uh, when animals could be active. Now, uh, when I'm really talking about this, I'm mainly talking about more of a predator-prey relationship. Um, I know this picture is just a red-headed woodpecker at uh, somebody's bird feeder. Um, I kind of like the picture. But if you kind of think about it, you know, these prey species, they're trying to obviously not get eaten. So one of the things they may have to think about, okay, when are my predators active? Are they active more in the day or are they more active during the night? And so that prey may have to decide, okay, which of the two are going to be most safe for me. On the flip side, the predator has to think, okay, when is my food most available? Is it most available during the day or is it most available during the night? Also, too, we have to think about, uh, you know, competition. Uh, you know, during the day, there could be more predators. Nighttime, not as many predators. Um, out there looking for that same food source. So again, food supply is a really big, big uh, factor uh, that again that can really control um, activity patterns. Uh, the next one, uh, and it kind of goes along with food too, uh, but temperature, climate, and seasons, I kind of put them all together. So this is just the pictures of Marion Tallgrass Trail, about the same place, one summer, one's winter. Um, obviously, we would see that, yes, animals would probably be more active in the uh, ideal temperature. So think about it in a desert setting. So, uh, you know, most of the times the desert during the daytime, really, really hot. Few animals are active, but not a lot. And then during the nighttime, these animals become more awake and they're more active because they don't want to overheat. Uh, but when it comes to like in the state of Ohio, uh, Marion County, we have more of a deciduous environment. So this is where our kind of where our seasons kind of go along. So kind of going with that with the snakes. Uh, we have a lot of different kind of snake species at Marion Tallgrass Trail. And um, I always tell people, you know, the really the, the, the temperature in the season is when uh, really could affect when you, you could see some. Uh, so during the really hot summer days, not going to see as many more in the cooler evenings you'll see more. Now, kind of vice versa, during the spring and fall, when the snakes are coming either in or out of hibernation, uh, this is when, uh, you know, I'm going to be seeing snakes more during the daytime than, I, than the evening. So, again, these two food supply, temperature, climate seasons, these are, again, probably the two biggest factors that really, really uh, contribute to uh, activity patterns. Now, I put human disturbances, so obviously if a human's going to come in, destroy a natural area, that's obviously going to be uh, awakening uh, animals out of their habitats, maybe have to find a new home, whatever the case may be. They may be already in the urban, suburban environment, already loud, already noisy, um, rather it's commercial, residential, a lot, of, a lot of different things can really uh, affect, um, you know, what, when an animal could be active. Um, in those kinds of environments. Uh, deer are a really great example. Sometimes here you can see it almost just, just all about, about parts of the day and the, and the day, the evening, and sometimes the night. But uh, I, I kind of added uh, other factors. Uh, so I have this picture of this raccoon. She has her kits or she has her young. Um, as you can see in this picture, it's not during the nighttime, which we know raccoons are primarily nocturnal. 
But, you know, she may have to take these young. They may have to find either new home. They may have to find uh, food. Uh, she may just be teaching them how to hunt. You know, if she was pregnant, you know, she may have to go out and forage a lot so she was able to keep up um, nutrients so, so to put supply for her young. So, again, a lot of different things can contribute um, when it comes to this um, activity pattern. But the big, big thing I want you to know, and I put it in bold letters and made it really big. You know, animals can change their activity patterns based on these factors. So the big, big question I either get on Facebook or uh, we get phone calls at the office. I see a raccoon, a possum, skunk, usually those three. They're, you know, nocturnal, but they're either running around my property or I see them at the Tallgrass Trail or your other parks. You know, are they sick? It could be, but most likely it's those factors I was telling you a little bit earlier. I usually tell people, you know, it's an animal that's probably trying to either find food, find shelter, uh, you know, is trying to avoid, you know, being eaten. A lot, a lot of different things can be going along uh, with that. Now, when I always tell people, if you think it's sick, kind of pay attention to behavior you know if it's not walking straight if it's you know limping if it's uh you know, obviously with rabies you know the big symptom is uh, the foaming of the mouth a lot of different uh, kinds of symptoms but basically use your best judgment if you don't see the animal is really acting right that could be a really good indicator that yes maybe the animal is sick so now we're going to be talking about some of the terminology um, or the words we're gonna be defining for this lesson. Now, it's actually kind of funny when I made this video, um, yes, I threw out some of the, uh, the basic words that a lot of you have probably learned in school or in other settings, but I actually have learned some new terminology that I have never heard before, but it makes a, a lot of sense. So the first one is diurnal. So uh, the, these are organisms that are mostly active during the daytime. So our great examples are a lot of our squirrel species, um, groundhogs, and most people. Um, so this is the time that the, these organisms are going to be active during the daytime and are going to be sleeping during the evening uh, night hours. Now, kind of going with the squirrels, uh, most of the squirrels are diurnal, but there is one exception. Um, it is the southern flying squirrel here in the state of Ohio and in Marion County. Next, we have nocturnal. These are organisms that mostly are active during the night environment. Now, there are a lot of different examples of nocturnal creatures. A lot of our rodents are nocturnal, but in this picture, so you're seeing an opossum, a skunk, and other examples are raccoons. As we mentioned before, the southern flying squirrel is another example of a nocturnal creature that you can find in Marion County or in the state of Ohio. So you might be wondering, well, how do these creatures, how do they see in the dark? Well, there are actually several ways on how they're able to do this. A lot of our creatures, like owls, have very, very large eyes to capture any type of light and also to see within their environments. Now, we could really go in depth, but we might save that for another episode. Now, it's actually kind of funny, owl's eyes um, are so big, um, they're actually not eyeballs, they're actually uh, more tube-shaped, so they really can't move their eyes very uh, much. Um, that's why they're always constantly moving their heads. But again, those large eyes are really, really important um, to able to so somewhat see in the, in the dark environment. Another example are our snakes. Now, they use the sense of smell. As you see them, flickering their tongues out. Uh, they're, they're grabbing the particles uh, out in the air and they kind of put it back into their mouths and they have a special organ in the back of their nostril called the Jacobson organ. And this basically just helps interpret you know, what's food, what's not. Uh, so this is really important in dark environments. And then of course we got bats who use the good old echolocation. So where they use that really high frequency radar a pitching sound and they reflect it out onto a prey, a person, a wall, and it comes back and it hits the, the bat and they're able to interpret 
you know, again, is this food, is this not? Um, and then maybe finding, you know, what direction, its speed, size, etc. And then now we don't have this in Ohio or in Marion County, but a lot of our tarantula species have these uh, setae hairs, as you see in this picture, very, very sensitive to touch. So that can be very important if they're in a dark environment. Next we have is crepuscular. Now I know this is uh, probably a term you probably have maybe not heard of. Uh, it's not mentioned in schools a lot, especially when I was uh, growing up. Maybe today they are. But basically it means organisms that are active during twilights or dawn or dusk. Now we have a lot, a lot of examples of crepuscular organisms in the state of Ohio and Marion County. Um, a lot of our rodents are crepuscular, and one of our famous rodents in Marion County is the beavers. Uh, we have beavers at Marion Tallgrass Trail, and uh, I always tell people the best time to see them is during dawn or dusk. Some of the other examples of crepuscular organisms, we have uh, deer, uh, weasels, uh, lagomorphs, you know, your rabbits. Um, so th those are just a small, small example of the crepuscular organisms. Now, it's kind of interesting. You really can break down crispuscular into two different groups or two different categories. Yes, you can have organisms um, that are active both at the, the dawn and dusk, but there's some that are very, very specific at the certain times. So this is a nice sunset picture of Marion Tallgrass Trail. I like to thank our very own Dan Sheridan for taking this picture. But uh, you can have organisms which are called vespertine, and this is when they're mainly active during the evenings. Uh, bats are a really, really great example. So yes, I know this is during the daytime. This is a picture I took at Marion Tallgrass Trail. We had a bat under the Nature Center. Um, that's about the best bat photo I can I could find. And then we have uh, sunrise, and these are mutilin uh, organisms, and this means that they're active mainly during sunrise. So a lot of our songbirds are, are mutilin, but also too, uh, praying mantises are a really great example of this as well. So now that we have defined some of our animal activity terminology, we're just gonna be talking about what are some of the advantages of being diurnal versus nocturnal. So why would you wanna be nocturnal? Well, one of the big things is you want to avoid competition. So if we think about this in the bird of prey world, a lot of our birds of prey, such as hawks and eagles and falcons, are active during the day, they're diurnal, and obviously they're going to be competing against one another for small to medium-sized wildlife. Um, our owls are nocturnal, so they're not competing against uh, some of those organisms. Avoid overheating. Uh, you know, you don't want to get too hot, you want to get dehydrated, heat exhaustion, very, very uh, practical reason why you want to be active during the nighttime. And uh, kind of think of this in a prey perspective, but maybe you want to avoid our rental uh, predators. As we mentioned, you know, if you're a little mouse, um, you know, if you're trying to survive, but you've got uh, hawks and eagles and falcons after you. And of course, there's a lot of different other predators as well. Um, but maybe your chances of survival could go up if you're active during the nighttime. Now, of course, there are nocturnal predators such as owls. So why be diurnal? One of the big things is easier finding food. As you see, this goldfinch is found out in the daytime, it's eating seed. It's, a, it's a really easy to find uh, food accessibility. And then maybe you wanna avoid nocturnal predators, such as owls. And then maybe the thing is, is maybe this organism is not adapted to living in a dark environment. So as we said in the one slide, you know, some of these nocturnal Organisms have, you know, special features, special tools, adaptations to be in the dark environment. Um, they may have large eyes, great sense of uh, hearing, taste, smell, may even have a special abilities such as echolocation. Again, really, really well developed uh, for uh, nighttime environments. Well, again, a lot of diurnal organisms really don't have that advantage. All right, everybody, a little recap of what we just learned in this episode some of the activity pattern factors. So we talked about what could cause an organism to be active during the day or the night. And we also talked about that, yes, it can switch depending on food availability, uh, temperature, season, climate, a lot of different things. And we also did talk about, again, just because an animal could be nocturnal, it could be active during the daytime for certain reasons. 
Um, we did define a lot of the different activity patterns. So we talked about, again, about diurnal. Uh, we talked about nocturnal, crispicular. Uh, we also got into some of the different categories of crispicular organisms and cathemeral organisms. And then we just talked about some of the advantages of being diurnal versus nocturnal. So uh, I was really, really glad about this episode. I was able to grab a lot of the pictures that you saw off of our social media account, Facebook, Instagram, and most of the pictures came from a lot of these people. I'm not going to uh, be naming, but I just really want to thank uh, these guys for allowing me to share the work, not on just social media, but also for these educational programs. A few of them, and you probably notice, were uh, from the internet, um, from Google or other resources, but I really, really tried my very best to keep a lot of the pictures uh, what, that are local and within Marion County. So these are some of my credits I have to give. So pixabay on slash.com, 